My name is Mario Martinez. I'm a police lieutenant with the Garden Grove Police Department and the Public Information Officer. Today we'll be providing you with information regarding two cold case homicides that have been recently solved due to the use of investigative genetic genealogy. These cases are the Shannon Lloyd and Renate Cuevas homicides that occurred in 1987 and 1989. The speakers at today's press conference are as follows in this order. Garden Grove Police Deputy Chief Amir Alfara, Yolanda Louis, who is Renee Cuevas' cousin. We also have Lee Neal, who is Janet Stolkup's sister, and Orange County District Attorney Todd Spitzer. I would also like to recognize and acknowledge the following who are here in support. We have Orange County Sheriff Department Commander John McCullough, other family members of our victims, also past and present detectives, investigators, forensic specialists, scientists, the Science and Technology Unit, and the IGG team. I would now like to introduce Garden Grove Police Deputy Chief Amir Alfara. Good morning. Before I begin with uh, sharing a prepared statement with you, I would first like to offer my deepest condolences to the families of the victims. Uh, losing a family member is always difficult and challenging, but it is even more tragic when you lose them to a senseless act of violence. Thank you for being here. I also want to extend my gratitude to all the detectives and investigators involved in these cases for your persistence, your willingness to see through it to the end, and always seeking justice for those victims who cannot be heard. Thank you for all your work and effort. In law enforcement, investigating homicides are one of the most difficult cases to work. Detectives spend countless hours trying to solve these crimes, and in many cases, leads are limited and information is scarce. Victims' families seek out information that many times law enforcement cannot provide and when all leads are exhausted, these cases are called cold cases by the law enforcement community. However, with ever-growing advancements in science, specifically in the arena of DNA and genetic genealogy, we are given the opportunity to take a look at many of these cases. I am pleased to announce that the Garden Grove Police Department, with the assistance and partnership of the Orange County District Attorney's Office and the Orange County Sheriff's Department, have recently solved two cold case homicides. These homicides happened 21 months apart and in two different jurisdictions, but were committed by the same suspect. I would li now like to take a moment to share the facts of these cases with you. On May 21, 1987, Shannon Rose Lloyd, a 23-year-old female, was found deceased in a bedroom she rented in the city of Garden Grove. An autopsy was performed, and it was discovered that she was sexually assaulted and died by strangulation. The crime scene was processed, and a sexual assault kit was collected as evidence. All leads were explored and pursued, but no witnesses came forward, and the person responsible for the murder was never apprehended. In 2003, the Orange County Crime Lab conducted forensic testing on evidence found at the scene and a male DNA profile was collected. It was at this time that male DNA profile was also a match to a suspect DNA profile found at the scene of a 1989 Orange County Sheriff's Department cold case homicide. The victim in that case was 27-year-old female Renee Cuevas. Her body was found along Lambert Road near the El Toro Marine Base in the morning hours of February 19, 1989. The male DNA profile found at both homicide scenes was submitted to the FBI's combined DNA index system, CODIS, but there was no match. For the last two de decades, Garden Grove Police Department and the Orange County Sheriff's Department exhausted all available leads, never giving up on these cases. In 2021, the cases were submitted to the Orange County District Attorney's Office investigating genetic gene genealogy unit. 
This team of scientists and investigators were able to identify a possible suspect, Reuben J. Smith. Reuben Smith was born on December 11, 1959, and was from the state of Michigan, but he had ties to the Orange County community in the 1980s. In the 1990s, Smith moved to Las Vegas, Nevada, where he was arrested for sexual assault and attempted murder of a female in July 1998. These charges were later dismissed, but in November 1999, Smith committed suicide by means of a firearm in the city of Las Vegas, Nevada. DNA evidence from Smith's arrest and the male DNA profile found at the scenes of Lloyd and Cuevas homicides were a positive match. We now know that Reuben Smith was responsible for the murders of Shannon Lloyd and Renee Cuevas. Homicides have an everlasting effect on the victims and families and loved ones. Many live with sadness, anger, agony, and grief. Many have questions and wonder why their loved ones were taken away from them. We hope that these cases being solved somehow bring some closure to their families. In closing, I would like to thank the Orange County Sheriff's Department, the Orange County District Attorney's Office, for our partnerships and willingness to solve these cases. I truly believe these cases were solved due to our work and dedication from our detectives from all three agencies and the use of the Investigative Genetic Genealogy Unit. This is not the first time the Garden Grove Police Department has seen success with Investigative Genetic Genealogy. Last year, the 1976 homicide of Janet Stalkup was also solved. Later, you will have the opportunity to hear from some of the victims' families on how the loss of their loved ones have affected their lives. I would now like to introduce you to Yolanda Louie, the cousin and family member of Renee Cuevas, for a few words. Good morning, my name is Yolanda Louie and I am Renee Cuevas' cousin. Um, first of all, I want to give the glory to our Lord Jesus Christ who allowed me to be here with you today. I want to thank the detectives who worked very really hard on my cousin's case and closed it and gave closure to the family. Um, my family wishes that they could be here today, but with work and um, it being so sudden that they couldn't be here, but they are here with us. And I just want to let you guys know that um, she is deeply loved and missed. Today is a good day. Um, the men and the women working so hard bring, brought restoration and peace to our family. I will not speak about the individual who took the life of my cousin Renee, but rather share her life with you. Renee was loved by our grandma Mercedes, known as Ama. Renee had brothers, Michael, Kelly, and Victor. She also had a sister named Raylene. She was surrounded by family who loved her. My mother, Emilia, who was her aunt, loved her deeply as well. All have passed. Renee had a son named Louis Ramirez. He resembles her plenty. He was her pride and joy. Renee was the kind of mom that gave her son the unconditional love that only she can give him. She, could always have, she would always have a gift for him, candies, toys, clothes, he had her wrapped around her finger. Renee had a beauty about herself. Long brownish red hair, very fair snow white skin, like an angel. And when she smiled, she radiated happiness. She had the most cutest dimples on her cheek, and her son Louis has the same dimples too. She was genuinely beautiful. One of my memories of Renee is when she came to our home, she had this white book with her and claiming to have been born again. She was so excited about that, she appeared like a dancing angel to me. Now that I'm older, I am born again too, and I'm excited just as she is. If I could speak with my cousin again, I would tell her how sorry I am. I would make her laugh so I can see her beautiful dimples. Someday I will get a chance again to hug you and to tell you I love you. Save a place for me in heaven. Revelation 21, 4, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning 
or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for being here. When a young person dies, it leaves a hole. And Janet's death left a hole for a lot of people. Um, my parents lost their daughter. My brother and I lost our sister. Um, our aunts and our cousins lost their niece and their cousin. Um, a large circle of friends lost one of the best friends that they ever had. I'd like to thank the Gardenburg Police Department and the Orange County District Attorney's Office for all of their dedication in solving this horrible crime so many years later. Um, 45 years is a long time, and unfortunately my mother has passed, and she never knew what happened. But the rest of my family is aware, and they're very happy that this is finally over, at least to a certain extent. Uh, we'll never have all the answers that we want, but we know now who, what, where. We'll never know why, but we go on and we deal with it just one day at a time. Again, my utmost gratitude to all the hardworking detectives and investigators who finally put this case to rest. Thank you. Thanks so much for being here. As the District Attorney of Orange County, it, it just means the world to all of us that you are willing to come out and tell us about your loved ones. You're always welcome to come here. This is the county's crime victim monument. It's a place that we always recognize victims. And if you look at the inscription, it makes it very clear we will always seek justice into eternity. And 45 years is not eternity, but for you and your family, certainly 45 years has felt, felt like eternity. And I'm so sorry that members of your family have passed and they were not able to see justice today. You know, in the old days, these great detectives in law enforcement solved these crimes through fingerprints and shoe prints and, you know, gumshoe detective work. And then phenomenally brilliant scientists developed DNA. And in 2004 in the state of California, myself, then Senator Brulte, then Senator Jackie Speer, and then Assemblymember Lou Correa, and I was in the state legislature, we co-chaired Proposition 69, and it was passed by the voters in 2004. And what we said was, we were going to collect your DNA if you were arrested on a felony. But for the fact that we were not collecting DNA in those days, there's a very good chance this crime would have been solved much earlier. But in order to have a match with DNA that you collect when somebody is arrested and incarcerated and all the inmates in state prison, we have their DNA, there's a gap. Because when the DNA samples were loaded up from the victims, from those crime scenes and from a potential suspect, it did not link to anybody in the CODIS system. The suspect and the person who killed himself, DNA was not in the system. And so therefore there was no ability to match the crime scene DNA with a known DNA sample in the CODIS system. And that's when a bunch of very, very brilliant scientists and others came up with genetic genealogy. In other words, reconstructing a family tree with a, a known sample, connecting that known sample back to people in the family tree whose DNA we do have or we have the ability to get it. For example, you know we prosecuted the Golden State Killer. That case was solved in California because of genetic genealogy. The Golden State Killer's brother had been arrested in Orange County decades earlier, but at that time we did not collect DNA. Had we collected DNA, we would have been able to potentially build back the family tree from the Golden State Killer's DNA back to his brother from the arrest in Garden Grove. And so today we can build those genetic genealogy trees 
and we can go back decades. And the important message I want everybody out there to understand, not just the victims, is that we never rest. So whether an arrest happens four minutes ago or four decades ago, this group of men and women, dedicated law enforcement, scientists, prosecutors, we never give up. We do not give up. And the fact that you're here today as victims is great inspiration for everybody who will either watch or read about this story. Because they need to know in Orange County we don't give up. So while you have a little bit of closure, not it, it'll go your whole life and we know that, we hope that through the solution and giving you at least this answer, it helps you move on with your life and allows your mom, for example, to rest in peace that much more gently. Many of you know that genetic genealogy uh, is a tool that law enforcement is using very, very successfully. The DAs in this state, the other 57 and myself, we've constructed an MOU. We have a preamble, a set of guidelines, and we use the genetic genealogy responsibly, ethically, and lawfully here in California. So with that, uh, the lieutenant will come back up and take any questions you have. So I'll end it with this. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank DA Todd Spitzer and his staff for allowing us to host this press conference here. I couldn't think of a better place than having it here at the Victims Monument. Um, the photos up, at, you see from your left to right, uh, it's Janet in the glasses, uh, Shannon in the middle, and then Renee in the dark blouse. Shannon's older brother, Tom Lloyd, was supposed to be, was scheduled to speak today, but unfortunately he was unable to attend due to a work conflict. But he did sit and speak with us, and I will be providing a link so you can all listen to that interview where he speaks about his sister, Shannon. We also spoke to the 1998 surviving victim and she also shared her story with us, and I'll also be providing a link where you could listen to that uh, interview. It, it, it is very, very, uh, um, very dynamic, and I cr encourage everybody to listen to the interview. So with that being said, um, if, if there's any questions, I'll take a couple questions before we close this off. Yes. <coughs> You know, I, I can't provide you an exact number or list, but I can tell you there's many, many cold cases out there, and those respective agencies are going back looking to see if there's any DNA or any leads that, that we can reopen those cases. So although I don't have an exact number, uh, th there are a lot that we're going back and looking at. Let me give you the flip side of that. Let me just tell you how many we have solved, okay? So the question is how many... What is the potential number of cold cases, the universe of unsolved cold cases? Uh, let me give you the other side of that same coin about the number of cases that have been solved. We have resolved four homicides in Orange County since the advent of genetic genealogy. And nationwide, law enforcement has closed 200 cases across this country as a result of genetic genealogy that but for the ability to rebuild those family trees and utilize known as against unknown samples, we would not have closed those other four, uh, 200 cases. As part of the memorandum of understanding, is there a regular cycle for which DA's office and police department cold cases are closed every year? Is that right? So the question is, uh, with respect to the MOU that the district attorneys have formulated, is there some protocol about how often, or a mandate or a dictate about how often the cold case DNA will be run through the system? The MOU is to set up guidelines about how prosecutors and law enforcement ethically conduct themselves with the searching of public databases and public information, and uh, how do they utilize that information in a law enforcement function. The database does not mandate 
any precepts about how often unknowns are run for this following reason. We believe that those cases should never be cold. In fact, I'd wish we should, could, and we should. In fact, I'll, I'll say today, we should never call those cold cases. Because that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a miss, uh, that's a, let me start that again. That's an inappropriate label today. Because of the advent of science, there's no case that's cold anymore. Every case is potentially resolvable. Whereas in the old days with the gumshoe, you know, detective work I talked about, yeah, I could understand without the advent of that kind of advanced science, it might be cold. But honestly, we should throw out this idea that there's a cold case. That, that case allows the victims to feel uh, abandoned, uh, somehow that law enforcement isn't working the case, or that they've come to a complete uh, uh, end uh, in terms of leads. That's not true anymore.